Thank you very much, Ange. Actually, just to tell half of the people here and half of Kids P has been under our kind of mentorship. So whether we were able to influence them positively or negatively, let me tell you honestly, I'm Oh, so proud of all of them. Anyway, uh, where's the clicker? There. Okay. I know I'm the oldest in this group right now. So I think we have a title of Advocating New Vaccines in the NIP. And I guess they picked me because I've been doing this for the last 45 years, my goodness. And as I said, actually, I would entitle this the past, the present, and the future of vaccine advocacy and communication. Now it's all up to you to choose which is past, present, and future. But this is my disclosure, and as I said, uh, aside from this, it's really teaching all those people there in PIDSP. So let me start off by saying that, as you all know, if you were to give messages about vaccines, you are doing advocacy, think, what are the three messages that you want to give? Well, of course, vaccination is the most powerful method of disease prevention. A superior doctor is one who prevents disease. An inferior doctor is one who treats disease. So you want to treat them? No way have to be preventive in this aspect. And that is what vaccine is all about. And of course, when you invest per dollar in vaccine, the mathematical computation is a ROI. You know what ROI is? Return of investment of $44. Tell that to the businessmen, and they will give all the vaccines to you so that they can earn the $44 in the long term. That's what is happening nowadays. And of course, the best argument is that vaccine can save the lives of our children. I'm a pediatrician of 47 years. See, 45 years vaccinology and 47 years pediatrician. Mathematics. That's because I first did my research in second year of pediatric residency where I looked at the new vaccine national immunization program that the DOH was doing, 1974. I know it was officially opened in 76, but in 1974, I looked at the children being born in PGH and so that only 10% of them are able to complete one year of the vaccination program. And that was published in the PPS journal and it won me third prize in the PPS research contest in 1974, my first award in research. And definitely, it also means that through the years, I can tell you the story of my life as a pediatrician and a vaccinologist. Advocacy in action, pneumococcus and rotavirus. Past, present, or future? Tell me. <laughs> That's past. That's 2012. Look at me there. I'm so young, right? <laughs> Don't you see me? That's why it's big. But this is in Asian. This is the Asian Strategic Alliance for Pneumococcal Disease, which we established in 2007 officially. But it started in 2006 when the first pneumococcal vaccine saw the, showed themselves in the Asian region. And of course, through the years, we got leaders. You know, the most important part of advocacy it's leadership. That's what Jerome Kim said in the last ASVAC. Remember the gaps that we have in vaccinology? There is the vaccination gap, there is the uh, manufacturing gap, there's diagnostic gap, and the worst is the leadership gap. That is where we all fail. Don't you think so? This is where we are in trouble many times. So here, you know those three people there, of those who you know, Ron the Gun? He was then pre president of WISPID, World Society of Pediatric Infectious Disease. Dr. Chan, president of IPA, International Pediatric Association. And Dr. Sanat Lamabadasurya Lamba, Lamba from Sri Lanka, president of Asia Pacific Pediatric. And they all came together in Cambodia in 2009 when we first held the Asian Vaccine Conference 
to see that children get their vaccination as priority for their health. And I think so proud of that. And that other one that you see that um, PACE, Numococal Awareness Council of Experts, that was actually by Dr. I hope it works. Can you put it up? The volume? Ciro de Cuadros, my hero in vaccinology. The children to control the mococcal diseases now. And with the vaccines that are available now, we can do that in the next five to 10 years. That's why the Sabin Vaccine Institute created PACE, the Pneumococcal Awareness Council of Experts, a group of 18 of the world's That's leading me. experts in infectious disease. PACE is dedicated to raising awareness among health and financial decision makers and securing national and global commitments to prevent pneumococcal disease worldwide. Orin Levin the son of Myron Levine. These are the pillars in the vaccine world. Myron Levine and Ciro de Cuadro, who died in 2014, is one of the biggest leaders in vaccinology, almost the same as Stanley Plotkin. And they are the ones whom we look as the leaders, whom we look as our advocates for vaccination. And choose to tell, I'm also proud that because of our involvement, in the Pneumococcal Awareness Council and being able to really get the pneumococcus in the Asia Pacific. Pakistan was the first country in Asia to get the PCV in their national immunization program. Can you believe that, Pakistan? The Philippines got it in 2012. Ahead of Singapore, which they did in the NIP in 2020. Can you believe Singapore in 2020? Others don't have yet the PCV. But in Africa, because of the pace, because of the Pneumococcal Awareness Council of Experts, Africa, actually, if you look at the map, I forgot to put the map, but Africa has almost a big number of them with Pneumo and Rota, which in Asia, if you come to think of it, slugging behind. Now, here's another past. Philippines will begin vaccinating children against rotavirus in 2012. And definitely, we were so proud of this because we were the first in Asia to put rotavirus in the NIP, 2012. And you know what happened, of course? Look at that. I was there. In fact, when Pinoy actually gave the first, Dr. Ona gave the first vaccine, to the pneumococcus, ah, the rotavirus, to a baby in Malacanang. That's in Malacanang, when he first introduced rotavirus in the NIP. And that was in Tagaytay when uh, we had the Asian diarrheal disease, where we gave an award Dr. Ona for becoming the first Asian minister to introduce rotavirus in the, in the Asia Pacific region. Okay, and as you can see, the Philippine experience is really more of getting advocacy. And I can't find a picture of Dr. Flavier, but he is one also of the heroes of our vaccination program. He was the one who put vaccination as really in the calendar of every year, from 1990 to 1993. Every April, right? Five million children will be given vaccine, catch-up vaccine. Every mother who failed to give their children. But then it was all children, whether you have had it before or not. And the threat then was for the private pediatricians, if you remember. The private pediatricians didn't want to be actually giving repeat vaccine. But Flavier did that. Though the children had been given before missiles, go ahead and repeat that. It will not get them harmed, but it will get our missiles and our polio eliminated. And truth to tell, in 2000, we were able to be eradicated for polio. And in 2005, whereas before that, 5,000 children were dying of missiles. By 2005, we had zero missiles and zero deaths, of course. No missiles, no deaths, no deaths, no missiles. 2005, that's a record-breaking thing. But then, of course, as you see, when, vaccine, when the 
feces are no longer there. Sometimes mothers start to become flaccent, you know, and those three C's, you know that all the pediatricians know the C's. Complacency, convenience, and of course, the confidence, which actually, if you look at this, this is our program, advocacy, the CDD, the diarrheal program, media networking, public-private partnerships, and of course, we are so high on legislation. Sabi nga nila, in the Philippines, there's so many laws. We are not lacking in laws. It's the implementation that's always, you know, baldado. So anyway, we did that. That's the advocacy in action. And you can see this is past. Payat pa ako nun. But one thing is uh, that Dr. Joseph Bresi, another handsome guy from CDC at the time. Kami ni Dr. Sally, wow. Enjoy kami pag dumadating yung mga taga-CDC. Tinatagalog ko para hindi nila maintindihan. Kasi guwapo siya talaga, yung mga taga-CDC. And Joseph Bresi, who was the epitome of rotavirus then, was here to teach us what rotavirus will give. So these are the things that we really look at. And when you become part of a group that will raise awareness, then you become inspired. And you really go and, and tell them that, yes, you can do it. So when you get to be involved, there's no going back. You really have to push and pull and make sure that if WHO says, OK, we will go ahead and try to get new vaccines, what do you use as your determinant? How do you go about it? Of course, you need the data. You need community involvement. You need better access to immunization services, especially for marginalized and displaced population. You need strong health systems, and you need access to vaccine in all places at all times. And then we had a decade of the vaccine from 2010 and to 2020. It is a decade that says that we should have a world in which all individuals and communities enjoy lives free from vaccine-preventable diseases. And how did they report the decade of the vaccine at the end of 2020? You know that even before that, in 2015, they said, we are actually on track. We have increased immunization coverage. We have reduced vaccine-preventable diseases. We are implementing advocacy events. But there are several challenges, and those challenges include introduction of new vaccines, specifically the vaccines that will prevent the two killer diseases of children. What are these? Pneumonia and diarrhea. That's why we were looking at pneumococcal and rota as our prime new vaccines at that time. But what happened next is everyone's disaster. No one was prepared for the pandemic, even the United States, even Europe. Tell me what country was prepared for that pandemic that struck, where the gains of the last 20 years was actually the gains in terms of immunization coverage, in terms of getting new vaccines into national immunization program was actually lost in just a year when the COVID vaccine, I mean, COVID struck. And this is where you realize that nearly 70% of countries experienced disruption in health services, including immunization. And that's where now you have to start getting all of your advocacy. Where will you start? We know that with COVID, you, the loss of lives, the loss of jobs, breakdown, I don't have to describe this because we are running out of time. Definitely, even before the COVID, there was already beginning loss or reduction, especially in the Philippines. And you know why, right? You know why? That even before the COVID, there were already increases in the number of children getting zero dose of vaccination. And the Philippines is one of the top, top, top 10 countries where the children are becoming unprotected. But when COVID struck, look at this. All the red ones, the most 
uh, age at which COVID or at which the impact of vaccination is felt is during the infancy, from age one month to 12 months. Early infancy, if you look at the red ones, these are the cross uh, line is the, are the countries. And you can see the red, most red are in the infancy. And although I, there were also effects on the children, adolescent, and adult elderly, it's not as much. And in terms of antigen and countries affected, I will not torture you with looking at this because it's complicated, but some countries were not affected. Korea, in terms of immunization, Korea, Japan, Australia. And in terms of antigen, I could see there the not that the most affected that were not being given at all as much is varicella, typhoid, those first two, and then you have diphtheria, polio, of course, and then measles. Those are the most affected antigens. So what happened next was that the immunization coverage actually dropped from the level of 2019 to 3% in the last year, or the first year of the COVID. And estimated 23 million children under the age of one year were actually not receiving their doses. And unvaccinated children increased by 3.4 million in the world. And you know, every one of them would be at risk of dying from the vaccine preventable diseases. And even HPV suddenly decreased. What are the reasons for disruptions in here? I'm sure this you all know. You can, if I ask you, even if I cover this, I know you will say, okay, they are fearing their travel restriction, their accessibility, change in priorities, government deprioritation. They don't know where to go. They have no awareness of where they will go next. So these are things that even other countries did have. But one thing about other countries in Asia Pacific, they rebounded in terms of immunization. There were only two countries in Asia that did not rebound when the COVID was starting, Pakistan and the Philippines. And Singapore, in fact, increased their number of antigens in the NIP. They added PCV in the NIP, that's Singapore. But for the others, they had no effect. Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, Hong Kong. So in our, we are now living with COVID-19. And that means that decrease in coverage means increase in your susceptible population. And of course, recurrence of COVID is very, very likely. The COVID-19 exposed the vulnerabilities in the immunization system. And with this, 23 million being unimmunized worldwide, inequity in access, oh, there are so many things we can discuss about. But in the Philippines, the one thing that we are always talking about, the elephant in the room, is always, why do we have a lot of vaccine hesitancy? Why is the 5 to 11 not getting the COVID vaccine that we need? And uh, Krisha just mentioned, where's Krisha? Earlier, that it is an effect still the, of the Deng Vaksha by Sanofi, which was approved in 2015 and was supposed to be a major milestone and a critical addition to the continuous efforts on global dengue production as stated by the Philippine Foundation for Vaccination. But what happened next is a disaster. When they said two died, you know, media is just so sensational. Two died during the dengue vaccination. What happened next? Drop in vaccine confidence. And then DOH said, Sanofi, refund our vaccine expense. You know, all of these things, even if they said, okay, there's no confirmed death. That's the DOH saying, okay, no confirmed death due to the vaksha. But then they said, but you returned the money that we gave you. What does that mean? It's so absurd, right? Anyway, the effect of the vaccine controversy, as you all know, is our loss of vaccine confidence, especially for children. Because then Vaksha was supposed to be given for children nine years to 10 years, right? So now we are left with this, the effect of loss in vaccine confidence, missiles outbreak, what happened next? Again, is history in the last three years, 
Look at the blue one, the light blue, the sky blue color is the Philippines. The rest are other countries in China, Malaysia, Mongolia. But look at that blue, sky blue line, where in 2019, we had 1,000 deaths of children in two to three months. You remember, we had no more deaths of missiles. Our residents were no longer seeing missiles. In the, in, in the hospitals, right? They don't even know what it looks like. Whereas when you were doing residency, every day there will be a death in missiles in our hospital. But then the residents do not know anymore what missiles is. In fact, they were putting missiles and dengue together in one room, thinking this could be dengue, <laughs> you know? And then in fact, it is missiles. Because they don't know what missiles is and they, Anyway, ah, running out of time, but the history of missiles is even now, we are reporting for 2022, the Philippines is reporting a 200% missiles case up this year, okay? So, not only the Deng Raksha, you do have also fake news circulating and uh, these vaccines causing autism. I remember when I was in Annecy, this was our topic of conversation. I remember Deborah, 2003, I was in Annecy. You were teaching us how to neutralize the MMR and the autism thing. It's still here, it's still not getting out, despite the fact that uh, Wakefield has already been, you know, we thought he would, but no, his recurring is so much still there. So anyway, some of these fake news that vaccine preventable diseases are really not life threatening and all that. And what do we need to do now are vaccine campaigns. According to WHO director, it is now, the moment is now to get essential immunization back on track and to look at catch up campaigns. So when you have missiles, which is now a very serious, very serious phenomenon, catching up campaigns are important. And the Philippines has not recovered from the missiles. We still are doing, uh, uh, BOH, we are still doing a lot of house to house missiles campaign at the moment, the key point is that in this pandemic, though we are slowly, slowly getting you know, out of this pandemic, there should be addressed, and the next future ones should really address this as a national immunization strategy, according to the WHO. For missiles, we need a cover range of 95%, as you know. We cannot just look at 50%, because there is always the threat that an outbreak could kill our children again. And impacting this, as we all know, and getting 73 million children still at risk all over the world. The threat is this vaccine hesitancy are actually affecting the implementation of the DOH health reform agenda. And this is also important because we now have the Universal Health Act where we are now implementing the HTAC is going for, you know, trying to figure out how we can strategize to make sure that our immunization coverage is actually appropriate on time, timely, and definitely preventable. And the budget should not be directed merely for treatment, but for, we mentioned, superior to be preventive than curative, right? And we have to subscribe to the immunization agenda of 2030, which is a world where everyone, everywhere, every age will fully benefit from vaccine for good health and well-being. And there are so many things we have to talk about in the immunization agenda of 2030. And remember, vaccine confidence cannot be increased by facts and education alone. We need a lot of this, and I'm sure Deborah will say that tomorrow. Right? Yes. You will learn so much from her, I tell you. I learned so much from her then. And the path towards this is really to strengthen our immunization system. We need to forge strong partnerships and hopefully even leadership. As such, our goal is to restore public trust, confidence, and acceptance and vaccination, health workers, and institutions. But we do need experts 
just like what uh, earlier, was it Brian who mentioned that, you know, these experts are needed who will respond with transparency, empathy, equity, equality, timeliness, honesty, and of course, confidence. And definitely, all our experts did that during the COVID. And that's why WHO said the Philippines had a good response, isn't it? Where's the DOH people here? We did have, di ba Marisa? WHO said the Philippines had even a bigger, greater response to the COVID than the US, right? Oh, ang galing ng response, but then, you know, political. I don't want to tell you anything about political because I don't want to be sued. I don't want to be jailed. So the way forward is really research, innovation, planning, forecasting, future, develop, effective. And this is the reason why I don't want to be jailed. We were there in that Congress. We were there. All my friends are still being indicted, almost 30 of them. Friends from way back, from the past, doing side by side on vaccination, treatment, pneumonia, diarrhea, we were doing it. And now they're indicted. Negligent imprudence resulting in homicide. Can you believe that? You can't, but uh, Tina, you can tell them all about it, how you did argue and debated with Scott Halstead to tell them they have blood in their hands. So ladies and gentlemen, vaccination matters. Try to get to shape public perception positively with the benefits that you do. No, you have to talk about this. You have to have those five minute elevator message that Deborah will tell you all about. I did my job then in rotavirus. I had a chance of that five minutes when I told in 2020, 2010, when I told the set Secretary of Health then, Dr. Ona, sir, no, he, he was talking to me and uh, there was chat there and Sally, my good friend, and he was saying, you know, the president told me we should do something about dengue. That was 2010. Do we have a vaccine for dengue? And I said, sir, we don't have a dengue vaccine. It will be 10 years from now. But what we need is a vac are vaccines that will prevent the deaths of pneumonia and diarrhea in our children. And he says, diarrhea? All, all you need there is clean water, isn't it? No, sir, because even in the US, they're using rotavirus. It doesn't mean that if you have clean water, you will not get diarrhea and diarrhea. And then he says, is that true? Give me the papers that will say so. And that was how the rotavirus came into being in the national immunization program. And I have witnessed to that. Dr. Sali unfortunately passed, but Dr. Chatabora was there to witness that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Remember. Nelson Mandela said, life or death for a young child too often depends on whether he's born in a country where vaccines are available or not. Thank I you very much, ma'am. We will have that. Thank you very much, Dr. Bravo.